After listening to the musical presentation, can you tell the difference between the music of heaven and the music of earth? And I ask only one question. Is it absolutely necessary to use the music of earth to win and soften the hearts of our young people? This morning we are going to take a lightning trip through the most dramatic verses in the Bible. And guess where we're going to find those verses? In the book of Revelation, of course. Please turn to Revelation chapter 12 with me. We will begin reading with verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the, dev and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Can you believe that text? War in heaven? The last place in the universe you would ever expect, expect to read a verse like that. But there was. There was war. Things were not as they should be. Now look at verse 3 of the same chapter. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne." Not only was there war, but a third of heaven's inhabitants followed the rebel. And then the war came down to this earth, and the war was fought over the person of the one who came into this earth from God's throne. And the attempt was made to destroy him, and it failed, and he was caught back up to heaven. Now look at verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Do you begin to see the sweep of this chapter of Revelation? We are now into the Middle Ages in which God's people are fleeing for their lives. And there was an attempt, an attempt to destroy them, but there was a place prepared by God for the faithful ones. Now down to verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his, mo his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. This is an all-out attempt. He had failed with Jesus Christ, and he now attempts to destroy this, earth, this church completely from the face of the earth. But the wilderness nourished the woman. The, the desolate places, they nourished God's church during this time. And now we come down to verse 16, and the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. God preserved his church when it looked like the church was going under. And now we come to our time, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. How does he wage war? Thirteenth chapter of the same book, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven and the earth on, in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image 
image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast and the ima- that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Again, the last battle and all out attempt to destroy from the face of this earth those who are faithful to God. And then we come to chapter 14, and we look over in verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. There we have the solution, the end to the story that began way back with the war in heaven, came down to this earth, and God finishing up the whole process. Go back to chapter 12 with me again. And look with me at verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. That's the the song of victory. That's the praise that will come from God's people. And it will only come from those described in chapter 14 and verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. There you have a lightning trip through the great controversy. All compacted into three chapters in one book of the Bible the most dramatic story that has ever been told or will ever be told for all eternity, all in a few short verses. Now let's examine that battle more carefully. Let's go back to the beginning of the great controversy. From the beginning of the whole fight, Satan said that God's law was unfair. He challenged God's law as being the enemy of peace. He said, the creator demands self-sacrifice. The creator demands self-denial, but he himself practices no self-denial. He makes no sacrifice of himself. His law is unfair. Sin, Satan claimed, was because of God's law. God gave a law that was impractical, unrealistic, and unfair to created beings. God is responsible for sin. Now, how could God demonstrate that his law was right, was a law of love, was a law that was good? Once the great controversy broke out in heaven, the stability of the divine government depended on someone coming into the picture who would demonstrate that the law is truly a beautiful thing, is truly something to be loved. Turn with me now to the beginning of the battle on this earth in Genesis chapter 3. When Satan is cast out of heaven, immediately he begins his attack on the new created beings. Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. God is a liar. That's what he's saying. God's warning was meaningless. Eve would suffer no harm from disobeying God. She need not obey God. And notice also, in Satan's argument, that unalloyed goodness is not really desirable. What is desirable is a mixture of good and evil, a balance of good and evil. Have we heard that in modern times? And so the war went on. Turn with me to the book of Job. A few places, just a few places in Scripture, the veil is drawn back. 
and we begin to see the great controversy beyond the sphere of our earth's existence. And in the book of Job, we have one of the most dramatic examples of that in the entire Bible in the very first chapter, beginning with verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro upon the, in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. Has that argument been repeated down through history? God, the only reason they serve you is to get some benefits. They want to have a nice life on this earth, and then they want to have eternal life. They would not serve you if you weren't handing out rewards. That's the basic argument that he has continued all down through history. And here we have a perfect example of it. Are we aware how nearly Satan came to winning this great controversy. How many people survived the destruction of the earth during the flood? And then when God brought his people into the promised land, how many of them came back from captivity? Only a few. Thank goodness that we don't have to depend solely upon the faithfulness of God, those whom God has chosen to represent him. We have promises, promises based on God's word, not on man's activities. And the best one we have is Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15, when the human race seemed on the verge of destruction, God stepped into the picture with this verse. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I, God, will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It, it, her seed, shall bruise thy head, Satan, and thou, Satan, shalt bruise his heel. There will be a war. But the war will not end in defeat for God. That's the promise. And that is the promise of the entire Bible. The controversy begun in heaven would continue on earth. It would be fought over every individual. Ceaselessly, Satan and his angels would seek through deception to introduce dissension into every family, into every workplace, into every community, and into every nation they would persuade people to disregard both God's health laws and his moral laws and saying that they were not fair, they were not right. And then we come to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 describing the single greatest event that has ever happened in human history. Verse 6, who, who is it? Christ Jesus, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of of the cross. You know, some people worry a lot about their reputation. There is something more important than reputation, my friends. It is character. 
And Jesus made himself of no reputation. What was Jesus Christ doing during this period of over 33, 30 years? He was unfolding the law of God. He was telling the universe what God was really like. He was saying God's law is not a law of selfishness. Look at me. I am that law. Jesus came to show what it was really all about. And there is a very, very fascinating statement from our modern inspired pen that says, the law of Jehovah is the tree, the gospel is the fragrant blossoms and fruit which it bears. Doesn't that turn it right upside down? We usually think of the gospel as the tree producing obedience to God's law. Here it's just reversed. That the law is the tree. The law is God. The law is his character. The law is his government. The law is the way God is. And the way God is produces love and grace and mercy. The gospel. It is out of the law that the gospel flows. And if you take away the law, there is no gospel. There is only favoritism and unfair practices. That reference is Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 212. What does Calvary tell us about the great controversy? First, it says God's law is good. It will last for all eternity. If we love Calvary, we have to love the law of God because Calvary is the ultimate expression of the law of God. Calvary shows what a beautiful thing God's law is. And then Calvary also shows us that Satan, not God, is responsible for sin. Desire of Ages, page 57. At the cross of Calvary, love and selfishness stood face to face. Never before in human history had they stood completely face to face, stripped of all outside accoutrements. Face to face, love and selfishness. Satan made it evident that the real purpose of his rebellion was to dethrone God and to destroy him through whom the love of God was shown. His argument had always been, look, I'll offer the, uh, you angels and the universe a better way. God's law isn't fair. I've got a better idea. And for the first time, it was clear that he was out to dethrone God and kill the Son of God. That was the first time it was clearly seen. I found the most remarkable statement in Signs of the Times, December 30, 1889. The death of Christ upon the cross made sure the destruction of him who has the power of death, who was the originator of sin. There will be no danger of another rebellion in the universe of God. That we're familiar with. We understand that that made it sure that Satan was a defeated foe. But now listen. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. The plan of salvation, making manifest the justice and love of God, provides an eternal safeguard against defection in unfallen worlds as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The cross was for the universe. We're just getting a little benefit from it. We just have a little outflow of what it was really designed to accomplish. It was designed to keep the universe safe from rebellion for all eternity. And so she says... Oh, we do not comprehend the value of the atonement. If we did, we would talk more about it. Why should man not study the theme of redemption? It is the greatest subject that can engage the human mind. It's a lot easier sometimes to focus on things, even prophecy, future events. What is going to happen? How many days between this and that? What do these symbols mean? The atonement. That's the theme of the great controversy. It is God's way to turn things around to meet the, answer, the challenge that Satan has laid against it. It is only in the light of Calvary that we can see what sin is. 
You see, someone else has joined Satan in his rebellion. The whole world stands charged with the murder of the Son of God. Testimonies to Ministers 264. Not a soul knows what God is until he sees himself in the light reflected from the cross of Calvary and detests himself in the bitterness of his soul. As long as we look at ourselves and think we're better than those people over there, we're doing fairly well. We do not know about the cross of Calvary. Because when we take a good look at the cross of Calvary, we will detest ourselves. Why? Because we were there. We were there. The lightning flashed. The thunders crashed. The bolts of wrath he bore for me. Then in the dark, some fiend I see. He nailed God's son upon the tree. That angry face was full of hate. Just who could be, could be so vile? He spat upon that lovely face. Who could it be? Who could it be? The darkness breaks. That fiend I see. Oh, it was me. Yes, it was me. I drove the nails at Calvary. The truth at last, at last, I see. Do we have a true concept of what sin is? Do we really? Every time we depart from right, when we know the difference between right and wrong, do we see it in all its hateful, malignant character? Testimonies, Volume 9, page 267. Those who have permitted their minds to become beclouded in regard to what constitutes sin are fearfully deceived. Have we let our minds get clouded? Oh, well, God will forgive me. Yeah, I'll just do it this once. I know he'll forgive me tomorrow. It'll be all right. Forgiveness is always available. He'll just wipe it away and forget it. Are we beclouded in regard to what constitutes sin? When we sin, the great thing is not so much the act that is committed or the word that is said. It is the enmity that exists in the heart. I don't like your law, God. It's unfair. I agree with Satan. And Satan attempted to kill the Son of God. Every time we depart from right, do we realize that in our hearts there exists murder against God. Murder against the Son of God. When a man repents, he vindicates God. What is he saying? It is not your fault, God. It is Satan's fault and it is my fault. That's what happens when we repent. A man who fails to repent of his sin, a man who blames his circumstances, a man who seeks an excuse for sin says virtually God is at fault. If he hadn't done it this way, I wouldn't have. It is God's fault for my sin. Calvary proves, and the life of Jesus proves, that no circumstance in which any human being can be placed is ever an excuse for sin. There is no excuse for sinning. But now, now we've got a question. If God is going to exterminate the devil and all evil eventually, why didn't he do so right now? at the death of Christ? Why didn't he do so long before we got into the picture? Why does a good God permit evil? There's a text in the book of Joshua that may help us. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. At the very end of Joshua's life, he challenges the people that will go on after him with this verse. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God l desires our love too much to destroy it by demanding it. Freedom to make choices on the basis of evidence underlies the entire great controversy. 
God knew it was best for the universe to become wise about Satan and sin and himself and his law through the examination of evidence, looking at the evidence. But still, the question is, if Christ's life and Christ's death convince the angels of God's goodness and of Satan's wickedness, could not God have destroyed Satan right after the cross? Why not? If the main questions about God's law and his character were answered by Christ's life and his death, why did the great controversy need to go on? Why didn't God destroy the devil and evil as soon as Jesus died on the cross? The principal reason seems to be the dull stubbornness of our human minds. Millions, billions of us humans still believe Satan's arguments in the great controversy. Many of us are still even on Satan's side in the great controversy by our life acts. We are still vindicating Satan in the way we live. You see, Satan challenges God. He says, all right. Jesus defeated me. Jesus lived the law of God. But where is anyone else that can do that? Their sins, oh, you've had some who have obeyed you, but they sin occasionally, and you forgive them. You cover them with the garments of your righteousness, and every now and then they commit sin again, and they fall again. Where is any people, any human beings that can keep the law of God like Jesus did. Oh, he says, you, God, you're up there in the sanctuary. You're just covering up the sins of God's people. You, they sin and you just pass them off and you say it doesn't matter. I have not, Satan says, I have not been defeated yet. You haven't proved anything yet. And God virtually says to Satan, I will produce those people through my grace in the most degenerate age of earth's history. I will separate them completely from all sin. They will reflect the image of Jesus fully. I will step out of the sanctuary and they will live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Such a people will be produced that will be the wonder of the entire universe. Through them, Satan will be forever defeated, and every question that could ever have been raised against the law of God, whether humanity can keep that law, will be forever answered in that special people that Scripture calls the 144,000. And now I want to take you to a thought that you may never have thought of before. Let's go back to the Day of Atonement. It's in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 16. After the services of the day are completed, after the sacrifices has been, have been offered, after the high priest has gone into the most holy place and come out, cleansing that sanctuary, we have one more little bit to add to the story. Chapter 16 of Leviticus, verse 30. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. That's what the day was all about, to cleanse the camp from all sin. Now look at the last detail in the story. It's in verse 20. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, it's all done, it's all clean, he shall bring the live goat, and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. A fit man. Someone who was able, someone who was prepared had to lead that scapegoat out into the wilderness. That was the last part of the whole day after the atoning process had been completed. And before Satan can be cast out of this earth, he must be completely cast out of the lives of God's people. All that hidden iniquity has to be revealed. 
The cleansing of the sanctuary is not just a work of cleansing the sanctuary up in heaven. That's easy enough. God can take care of that. But it means the final making away of sin in the lives of God's people, taking away the dominion of the man of sin for all eternity. Here is a people now, for the very first time, who have lived upon this earth for the first time in 6,000 years, who have had all their sins blotted out, who have been sealed for eternity. And God can say in the face of the whole universe, here is a people that have been completely separated from sin. And he will also say they will never go back into sin again. And by virtue of the fact that these people will never go back into sin after the final work of the most holy place, by the mere fact that once they have been separated from sin, they will never touch the stuff again, Satan is ultimately proved to be responsible, not God. But on the other hand, if Satan could lead them into a departure from right in the least particular, he has won his point. You see, there had to be a fit man back in that Old Testament story who could lead and would lead the scapegoat into the wilderness. There had to be someone who could take him away, who was able and fit enough and strong enough to do it. While the scapegoat was being led away into the wilderness, he made a desperate effort to escape. And during the plagues, all the energy of Satan is going to be expended against the saints, the 144,000. A remarkable sentence in the Spalding and McGann collection, page 2. While the plagues are falling, the scapegoat is being led away. He makes a mighty struggle to escape, but he is held fast by the hand that leads him. If he should effect his escape, Israel would lose their lives. I saw that it would take time to lead away the scapegoat into the land of forgetfulness after the sins were put upon his head. When Jesus steps out of the sanctuary, he virtually says to, his, to Satan, Here are my people, Satan. They are yours now to do with as you wish. Only you cannot take their lives. Satan has full charge of the legions of darkness, and all the wicked join him. And a whole vanguard comes against God's people to overthrow them, but he is held fast. If Satan could lead one, just one, of the 144,000 into sin, if he could lead them, one of them to depart from God's law in the least particular to transgress the law, he would triumph. The fit man will be able, through the strength of Jesus, to do it because they will not fall. They will stand. It is in the 144,000 that Jesus Christ wins the great controversy. It is a desperate struggle between Jesus and Satan. On earth, it was a struggle between Jesus and Satan personally. And during the last event of the plagues, it is a struggle between Jesus and Satan again, but now in the person of those who are living the life that Jesus lived. The very fact that Satan will not be able to lead them into sin, to transgress God's law, in that very fact Satan is defeated, his cause is lost, and he is held fast. You see, God has to give to the angels some assurance that the plan of salvation is really successful. It works. What assurance do the angels have that all the redeemed who have died down through history will not go back into sin again? Some have been converted on their deathbeds. What assurance do the angels have that they will not go back into sin again and slip and fall sometime? Once God blots out the sins of his last people, the living saints, he gives them over to let Satan do whatever he wishes to them.
tempting them, testing them to the uttermost. He puts them through Satan, puts them through every trial that he could ever devise. In the most discouraging, the most terrible circumstances, and they prove, they prove that the plan of salvation is a success, that it works, that it saves to the uttermost. But if the scapegoat should escape, Israel would lose their lives, not just the 144,000. All Israel, all the chosen ones of God down through the centuries. God is waiting for a people at the very end of time upon whom he is going to stake his throne. God is going to risk all upon the 144,000. If the scapegoat should escape, all Israel would be lost. The plan of salvation would be proven to be a failure. You see, there's only one thing that God's faithful people fear during the time of Jacob's trouble. They realize that everything does depend on the last generation. They realize that they could disgrace God's throne. That is why this company is going to taste more fully than any other humans who have ever lived the experience that Jesus lived through during his life on earth. There is one more text we need to read. It's in the book of Hebrews. It's in the famous faith chapter, chapter 11. After all these great heroes of faith are described with their tremendous obedience and living out God's will, there is one verse at the end which sometimes we forget. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 40. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us, they, the heroes of faith, without us, the last ones on the face of this earth, they without us should not be made perfect. There could be no resurrection of the righteous without the victory of the 144,000. They without us will not be made perfect. They, Abraham and Moses and Noah and Elijah, Elisha, all of the heroes of faith, are waiting upon God's last day church. Someone who can vindicate God's character, someone who will defeat Satan, someone who can lead the scapegoat away. They are waiting. When God raised up a movement 150 years ago, it was not his purpose to raise up just another church along with many other churches. The special work of the 144,000 is to call a people out for the seal of the living God. Not until that is done can the work be finished. That work, friends, is to finish with sin. That work is to finish with sin. He is waiting for a people through whom he can do this special work. Sometimes we lose sight of the purpose of the third angel's message. God has not raised up a movement just to prepare another generation to go into the grave. If we go on in the way we are going on, Satan could never be led away and the work could never be finished if we continue going on in our business as usual in the Seventh-day Adventist church. The devil comes along and tells us, Oh, you Adventists, you're doing a marvelous work, a wonderful work in the world. Look at all the people you're helping. Why, you are raising up schools and hospitals and institutions and churches. You're growing into the millions, almost 14 million of you now. Just a few years ago, there were only three or four million. You Adventists are doing the best work you could possibly be doing, Satan says. Just carry on with the way you are doing it. Anything, you see, anything to blind us to the work that is being left undone in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. That he might blot out all sins and seal his people with the seal of the living God. What a, such a victory is waiting for God's people in the most holy place. And that's why God called a movement into existence 150 years ago, sent them through a great disappointment, raised up a prophet to lead the way, sent messengers a hundred years ago to call God's people to prepare for the final events, 
waited again because that generation was not ready and has now come again to this church in this generation, all for one purpose, to prepare people to receive the seal of the living God. That's all there is. That's what Adventism is all about. There is no other reason for our existence. Saving souls, praise the Lord, we can save souls along the way to that goal. And that will also produce a a, a heart response to be ready for God's seal. But that is not the primary reason for our existence in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Jesus says very simply, Behold, I have set before you an open door. The door is open. The latter rain is on the other side of that door, waiting to fall upon God's people, waiting our demand and reception. Jesus is waiting to finish with sin. He's waiting to finish with sin. If God's people will set their faces like a flint to go up to God's sanctuary, the work will be finished, and we will go home. And so, my friends, May we today see the purpose for which God called us to be Seventh-day Adventists and see what Jesus is waiting to do that we might, through Jesus, through his grace, strive with all our might to be among that special company which is called the 144,000. As far as I can see, there's no other reason for my existence. I do not exist on this earth for any other reason than that. Anything else I do is just a side activity. I exist to vindicate God's name and end Satan's rule on this planet. Will you kneel with me in a prayer of dedication this morning? Father in heaven, we have marched around a mountain for many long years. And as we have continued marching into the wilderness and here and there, conducting business and doing things, we have lost sight of the real reason that we began the march to the mountain, that we passed through the Red Sea, that we came to hear your character expressed in your law. Lord, we have gotten careless. We have gotten busy with the work of the church. We have gotten busy doing good things, helping others, even saving souls. And sometimes we have forgotten what it really means to be, to seek, to want with all our hearts to be part of the last generation, to be part of the 144,000, to be done with sin, to say to the entire universe, God's way is right and I will do it no matter what happens. I will die rather than dishonor my heavenly Father. Lord, help us to have that vision once again. Help us to see why we were placed on this earth. Help us to understand why you called a church into existence, not to be another gray church in a sea of gray churches, but to be that shining light that will shine for the rest of eternity, that will protect the universe for all time from ever dabbling in rebellion again. May this be that generation, I pray. Father, touch our hearts, soften them, break them, Take all the pride and the selfishness and the pleasures of the world away and help us to take another good look at the cross of Calvary and detest ourselves in the bitterness of our soul for our carelessness, our sinning, and our Laodiceanism. May we see that there is no remedy except your love, your mercy, your grace, and your law. The only way that this earth and this universe will ever be a safe place to live in once again. I pray for this people and I pray for myself that we truly may be in this hour of earth's history Seventh-day Adventists by Jesus' grace and in his power. Amen.